Okay, so this morning it's, it's tutorials week. So I've got a, a talk where I'm going to spend the first half of it approximately with a little bit of introduction to some optics and some exit wave reconstruction because these are the essential tools that I'm going to use to underpin some of the applications data that I'm going to show in the second half of the talk. So just before we start, I just want to thank all the various people in my team uh, at Harwell and in Oxford. So Chen, Judy, James and Abner who are at the Rosalind Franklin Institute. Kevin Trader is a, a student of mine who's just currently finishing the final chapter of his PhD thesis. So he's a, a busy guy at the moment. But he's done the work on the machine learning that I'll show later. Don Ozkaya, he's an industrial collaborator and he's provided us with some, some real materials that are important to industry. Uh, Colm, um, who some of you will probably know, he was a student of mine in Oxford with Pete Nellist, but he's now working with John over, at, over here. And Lena Baisley, who's my tame quantum theorist at Nottingham University, who's done all the DFT ND calcs I'll show a bit later on. So the first question I want to address um, is, I'm an electron microscopist. I've been in that game for over 20 years now. And the first question we ask is, John talked yesterday about various diffractive imaging methods using x-rays, but what's the advantage of using electrons? And this is a slide that late John Spence gave me, and I think it's a fantastic slide because it contains all the information which justifies my being as an electron microscopist. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to compare some cross sections for various interactions of electrons, and I'm going to compare these in barns. Now, for those of you, I'm sure all of you know, but a barn is actually a unit of area. It's 10 to the minus 28 meters squared. And it it's used by the particle physics community to represent cross sections for scattering. So it's the interaction area. And I've just plotted here a protein. This is a physicist view of a protein. It's a large red circle. And I've plotted on top of that the cross sections for elastic collisions. These are the image forming. These are the collisions that contain useful structural data. And the inelastic collisions, which are the damaging collisions. These are the ones that damage our sample. I've done that for, X, for electrons at 100 kilovolts and also for X-rays at 10 kilovolts. And the first thing you notice is that the electron cross-sections are much larger. It's 10 to, the, 10 to the 8 barns for the elastic and 3 by 10 to the 6, sorry, 10 to the 6 barns and 3 by 10 to the 6 barns for the elastic and inelastic cross-sections compared to the X-rays for about 2 barns and 20 barns for the elastic and for the photoelectron cross-sections. So the electrons have much bigger cross-sections, so on average, more electrons are going to interact with the sample. Now, that's good and bad. It means for a given flux density, we need fewer electrons than we would need X-rays. But as Peter mentioned yesterday, it comes with a problem because, of course, the electrons interact strongly. We have significant multiple scattering, and that means we've got to look at computational simulations to match the image data or the diffraction data that we get from an electron microscope. And that's not a problem that the X-ray community have. So the other thing about electrons is, as well as these larger cross-sections, we have to look at the ionization de deposition energy. And for electrons, for each ionization event, you deposit on average about 20 electron volts, whereas for the X-rays, you deposit about 8 kilovolts. So for each inelastic collision, the electrons are less damaging than the X-rays. Yes? Could you comment on like the uh, 100 kV electrons? Because like, it seems like it's a lever you can push. Could you consider electrons with less acceleration? And I could have done. I just happened to calculate. This is a typical sort of low voltage. I could, I could recalculate this at 10 kilovolts or at, 30, at 300 kilovolts. And if you want to do that, you simply multiply these cross sections by 1 over the voltage squared. I see, but so why putting those two numbers side by side? Is it because it's representative of the... T 10 kV is a typical hard x-ray okay. from a synchrotron. It's a typical hard x-ray beam line at a synchrotron. 100 kV is a typical low energy electron microscope. Thank you. Just practical, but you can, you can scale that by 1 over v squared. Okay, so we've got less damage for, for each inelastic collision, bigger cross-section. That's a good justification for using electrons. One thing to note here, however, is typical incident fluxes, or the best flux for electrons, is about 1 by 10 to the 6 electrons in 100 femtoseconds. This is actually for a 3 megavolt instrument in Japan. 
Whereas for the X-rays, if you look at the x fells, you can get flux of about 10 to the 12 X-ray photons in a, in a similar 100 femtosecond timing, and that just simply arises from the huge gain in the x fell So the flux available to the X-ray community is something of the order of six orders of magnitude higher in 100 femtoseconds than it would be for electrons. So any experiment where you want high flux in very short time frames, then the X-rays and the x fells are the, if you like, the weapon of choice. Okay, so that's a justification for using electrons. They have larger cross-sections, although that does come with a caveat, and they are, in general, less damaging per inelastic collision. So that justifies my existence. Now, what am I going to do now? I want to summarize what I'm going to talk about. The first half, I said, is a little bit of an introduction. It's a tutorial week. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I have a question about that. So this is a, a justification why to use electrons instead of x-rays. But it's, I'm not a physicist. What else could you use uh, instead of electrons? Because I remember, I think you showed on Monday this um, graph of uh, historical advances in resolution data sure. in microscopy. And then we have light microscopy and the electron microscopy. And this looks like we should use something else than electrons now. Another particle with a shorter wavelength. Yeah. yeah. So, but then you're, you're starting to build a micro. There is no microscope, for example, for protons. Okay. So practically, you know, in terms of instrumentation that's currently available as we stand here today, it's optics, which of course are wavelength limited ultimately. X-rays with shorter wavelengths, better spatial resolution, but and then electrons with even shorter wavelengths. So yeah, you, you could go to a heavier particle, an even shorter wavelength, and you'd, in principle, go to higher resolution. I, I just make a point there, and it's something that Peter mentioned yesterday. With electrons now, we're, we're at the resolution limit of somewhere around about 40 picometers at 300 kilovolts. 40 picometers allows you to identify individual atom columns in almost all projections for all materials. So actually, there is relatively little motivation for trying to push the resolution much further. There is also a problem in that if you want to push the resolution further, you've got to overcome something called the Johnson thermal noise in the electron column. This is where the electrons induce little magnetic vortices in the column, which then blur the image. And that's a fundamental physics limit. So actually, improving optics, I'll show you later, we're pretty much at the point at which there's no real advance to be made. And there's no real motivation for making any advance because we can already resolve all the atoms in most materials. Okay, so I, I want to talk a little bit about some geometric and wave optics because that's going to underpin a lot of what I talk about later. I want to talk then about exit wave reconstruction. This was sort of mentioned yesterday. It's a, an extension of what John talked about, and this is methods for inverting the imaging process in the microscopes. It's go, a way of inverting from image data, intensity data, back to the complex wave function at the exit surface of specimen. I'm not going to say anything about the second inversion problem, which is the inversion of the wave function back to the projected potential. And I want to just show you three examples. Uh, firstly, some tychography using electrons at very low dose and looking at biological materials. So this is a way of designing strategies for phase efficient reconstruction. So we want to make the most of all the available electrons. So we want to ensure an experimental design that maximizes the structural data we get from a particular number, an electron budget. I want to show you then analysis of very high speed data. So this is very low signal to noise ratio data. And this is the problem of how much data can we extract from a very limited number of electrons. And this involves some machine learning. Finally, at the end, I want to talk about smart, sparse data acquisition and processing. So this is partly to reduce radiation damage, but also to make sure that all the electrons we have in the system are useful electrons rather than damaging electrons. So this follows on from what Peter talked about yesterday. This is just phase contrast, a particular form of imaging in the microscope, phase contrast imaging. So we start off with an instant wave. That can be a plane wave. That plane wave propagates through the specimen, and we can model that, as Peter showed yesterday, with a transmission function. So this T here, T of x, just models the scattering through the sample. 
And I'm not going to say anything more today about the form of that function. Peter mentioned it in great detail yesterday when he was talking about the multi-slice algorithm. We then have uh, a wave function in the back focal plane of the microscope. That's a Fourier transform relationship between the exit wave and the back focal plane. We then propagate through the objective lens to form an image wave. And that image wave now is the exit plane wave, it's the Fourier transform of the exit plane wave, multiplied by this function h. And that function h just describes the effects of the objective lens. The objective lens in the microscope is pretty much the only lens that's important in modeling the imaging process. Take another Fourier transform, and then finally we record at the detector plane this intensity, just a square modulus of this image wave here, multiplied by this function mtfx. And mtfx just describes the modulation transfer function. It simply describes the blurring effect of the detector. So there are three, if you like, parameters we have to try and model. Firstly, the scattering, which Peter talked about. Secondly, the imaging, the objective lens, which I'm going to say something about. And also the detector becomes important because that introduces another blurring function. I'm not, I haven't got time today to say anything about detection, but modern electron detectors are capable of single electron counting, but they do cause a blurring due to the spreading of the fast electrons in the silicon of the detector. Is the blurring kernel known? Is it convolutional it, Gaussian or something? It, it, it is known. It's a great question. It is known. It's not a pure Gaussian. It's, it's a hybrid of a Poisson distribution with a long tail. You can model it. You can do essentially, you can do a scattering calculation for the fast electron through silicon. Look at the part, look at the integral over all the paths the electron might take. And that will give you a, 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 a numerical approximation to that blurring function. Well, it's not blindly blurring. It's uh, not blind. On, sa sadly, if it, if it were, life would be so much easier. Well, blind, it would be harder. <laughs> yeah, but it's not, it's not a well-defined function, unfortunately. Oh. OK, so part one is talk a little bit about some geometric optics. Now, I mentioned this on Monday. There is a problem with electron lenses. Uh, whereas, you know, I'm wearing a pair of glasses, which you can buy for a couple of hundred dollars or less, depending on your budget. And these glasses are, you, you can control the aberrations to correct my eyesight by controlling the refractive index of the material. And you can grind the glasses to any arbitrary shape. With electron lenses, you don't have that option, unfortunately. And the problem is, basically, that for a round lens, the Schertzer theorem, this is 1936, Otto Schertzer published a paper in Optic, which showed that the spherical aberration and the chromatic aberration of an electron lens is always finite positive for lenses that are rotationally symmetric, so they're round, they have a static field, and they're charge free on the optic axis. So there's no electrostatic components. These are pure electromagnetic lenses. And the problem is, objective lenses for conventional optics satisfy all three of those criteria. They are rotationally symmetric, they have a static field, and they have no electrostatic element. So in other words, typical electron lens will always have a positive, finite, spherical, and chromatic aberration. And no matter what you do in terms of stability or mechanical precision, you can't beat that problem. If you're interested, it actually arises from the boundary conditions for Maxwell's equations, which determine the shape of the magnetic field. So in other words, you've got to break one of these criteria. Building in electrostatics is hard because you end up with very, very high field gradients. That's, a that's an engineering difficulty. Making the field pulsed has been attempted, but the problem is for electromagnets, the field is very strong. You have a significant inductance in the coil, so actually pulsing it rapidly is almost imp is impossible. So the only choice you've really got is to break the rotational symmetry and that's the basis of all aberration correction, is you introduce into the optical column some non-rotationally symmetric elements which compensate the inherent aberrations of the round lens. So here are some examples of some, some non-rotationally symmetric elements. Here's a simple dipole. A dipole just introduces a deflection to the fast electrons. They come in this side and they get deflected by this field. Here's a quadrupole. Now, a quadrupole is four poles, 
north, south, north, south. And that turns a round beam, a round focus, into a line focus. Here's a sextipole. That turns a round beam into a sort of three-pointed star. It looks like a, similar to the star you see on Mercedes-Benz cars. Here's an octopole, which turns a round beam into a four-pointed star. So the effects of magnetic multipoles are twofold. Firstly, they affect the shape of the Gaussian beam. But the second effect is when you combine these together, you get combination aberrations, and it's actually the combination aberrations which are used for the electron optical correction. So, non-round field is needed to circumvent Schertz's theorem. The first order effect just changes the beam shape, and the second order effects are used for the aberration correction. So here is an optical diagram of a typical corrector. This is one of the first correctors that was made available commercially. It's based on a number of elements. Here's the objective lens of the microscope. Remember, that has a spherical aberration. It has a, a transfer system here. It's a pair of very weak round lenses. It has a long hexapole element, another transfer doublet, and a second hexapole element. And what this does is the aberration, the first order aberration of this hexapole element, if you remember, turns a round beam into a three-pointed star. So you can see here, here's, the beam, here's just a plot of the beam, here's the round beam coming in, and at the first hexapole, it's turned itself into this threefold symmetric shape. This second transfer doublet simply inverts, it's got a magnification of minus one, it inverts the star from the first hexapole into the second hexapole. So in other words, it ensures that the hexapoles are anti-symmetric with respect to each other. First one has a star, makes a star that points upwards, the second one makes a star that points downwards. So the first order aberrations of these two hexapoles cancel each other out. But the second order aberration of a hexapole, a long hexapole, is a negative spherical aberration. So the base of this corrector is we cancel the first order aberrations and utilize the second order aberrations to compensate for the, C for the positive CS of the objective lens. Now I showed this slide before, but I think it's important just to look at the scale of the problem. So this is, you saw this on Monday, this is a, a photograph actually taken with my iPhone, but then rescaled to the aberration coefficients that you would see in a typical electron lens. So I've taken the optical, coef I've taken the optical coefficients and scaled them. So this is before correction. It pulls in the back there. You can see, actually, there's, there's the ronchigram in the middle of this. And if you compare that to the original photograph, it's my iPhone photograph of the Houses of Parliament in London at night time, you can see just how bad uncorrected electron optics were. So really, this was the problem I showed in that graph that you mentioned, whereby for a long while we were typically at something like a 100 lambda or worse limit in terms of resolution before correction. We're now at something of 20 to 30 lambda after correction. And you might ask yourself why it's taken quite so long. I mean, Schertz, we knew about this. We knew the maths and the physics behind this back in 1936. The first correctors didn't come on stream until 1997. So it took the best part of 60, 61 years to actually get a practical solution. And the reason for that is quite simple. It's an engineering problem. If you want to have a 78 picometer resolution, and you've got an objective lens with a focal length of two millimeters. That's typical for most microscopes. Your beam width in the lens, you can do simple, a simple geometric calculation, is 62 microns in the lens field. And your corrector has got to shape that wave field to five picometers over a 62 micron distance. Now, that is, as I showed on Monday, same as engineering a surface, a flat surface, which is roughly the length of the African continent, with a height variation of about seven centimeters. So it's a very, very severe practical engineering tolerance limit. And the tolerance is all set partly by the mechanical engineering, but also set by the stabilities of all the current and voltage supplies in the corrector elements. Yeah? Uh, so I have a question about, um, so 
it seems like some aberrations can be corrected computationally. So like, is there a scale where things can be corrected computationally and another scale where they have to be corrected in hardware? Like, you, 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 could, you can measure all the aberrations computationally and you can adjust for them. I'll show you in a minute. Adjusting for them doesn't actually solve the problem of increasing the resolution. Okay, we'll, we'll come on to that. We talk about wave optics, what the effects of these aberrations are on the image. But essentially, they, you can think of the aberrations as functions of confusion. They pollute the image, but, you, but they also introduce zeros. Okay, so they, they, remove, they remove data as well as corrupting data. And once the data is removed, you can't get it back computationally. Okay. I want to show this slide because people like me have got grey hair, spend a lot of our time writing grants and flying desks these days. You can introduce a figure of merit for any optical system, a very general figure of merit, and it's just simply the diameter of the primary optical element divided by the precision to which that optical element can shape the wave field. Now, I've got two optical systems here. Uh, this is a, a, an aberration corrected microscope. It was one in Oxford that we installed around about 2000. Uh, this is the Hubble Space Telescope. I, I should update this actually with James Webb now. I should change this slide. And the figure of merit for the microscope is about 1 by 10 to the 8, compared to Hubble in its pre corrected mode, which was about 2.5 by 10 to the 7. But now, of course, you've got to expand this. The cost of the microscope is about $3 million. Hubble Space Telescope, about $2 billion. And so you can introduce here a value for money index. Uh, and the value for money index for the microscope is about 33. For the Space Telescope, is a 0 0.0125. And when you go to DOE or NSF for funding, then you can tell them that actually electron microscopes are much better value for money than space telescopes. Is that figure of merit about the same for all optical setups? Uh, it, de it depends on how precise the lens is ground. And you remember when they okay. flew Hubble the first time, there was actually an error in the primary mirror. So it, it is an indicator of the quality of your optics? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Cool. It's, 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 an, it's an indicator of the quality of the optics. And of course, the quality of the optics depends on the precision, but also the diameter. It's really hard to grind a mirror the size of, well, you've seen James Webb's mirror. The precision on that is you know, unbelievable. Whereas grinding a pair of glasses this size is a simpler issue. <laughs> OK, I want to move now from geometric optics to wave optics, because wave optics are the things, are, are the, is the framework which describes how these aberrations affect image quality and image data. So let's just look at a, a very simple aberration. I've got here a plane wave illuminating my sample. And the diffractive wave is diffracted wave is a spherical wave. That spherical wave here passes through a perfect objective lens and it reforms a point on the detector plane. So it turns a point back into a point because the lens is perfect. Does mm -hmm. so that mean you're changing equations? Sorry? You're changing equations when you move from Yeah, I I'm changing the framework. Stand. So geometric optics looks at the ray paths. Yep. Yeah. The, the wave optics, I'm going to show you now, talks about the effects. It, it frames the aberrations in terms of the effect they have on the phase contrast image. So it's not solving Maxwell's equation. No. No. We, we've moved into a different, a completely different way of describing the aberrations now. So th this has no relevance to the design of the optical components. It has relevance to the effects of the aberrations on the image. So there's my perfect microscope, point to point. Here's a real microscope, and I've introduced here an aberration. And what I've done is I've defocused, I've weakened the lens, so I've now got a defocus introduced. Now you can see my point object is now imaged on my detector plane as a disk. Now we can quantify that by looking at the difference between the ideal spherical wave field, that's this black curve here, and the so-called aberrated wave field. So it's the difference between the true wave field and the ideal wave field. And that gives us an aberration coefficient. That gives us a set of aberrations. So the aberration I'm talking about now are just the difference between the ideal wave field for a perfect lens and the true wave field. Now, we need to just expand this a little bit 
And in general, the wave aberration function depends on a number of variables. It depends on the scattering angle, the angle of the instant rays to the lens. It depends on the complex image plane position, it depends on the position in the image space, and it also depends on the energy deviation. So it's, it's a function in general of five variables. So here is the wave aberration function. I've written it here in a complex notation. And you can see omega here is the complex scattering angle. W is the complex image plane position. And E is the energy deviation. Or delta E over E0 is the energy deviation, where delta E is the energy width, and E0 is just the primary energy. Now, in general, most 90% of all papers published, we now ignore all the coefficients that have a dependence on W. So they don't have, they have dependence on the image plane. That's what's known as the isoplanatic approximation. So we assume that the aberrations are constant across the image plane. I say it's true in 90% of the publications. For very large detectors, for very large detector fields where the image plane is extended, you actually can start to see the effects of what are the so-called off-axial aberrations. We also ignore the dependence on E, that's the isochromatic approximation. So we ignore all these chromatic and off-axial chromatic aberrations here. Now, it's useful to recast this expression into polar coordinates because it gives you a better feel for what the aberrations look like. So here's my, my diagram showing the ideal wave front and the aberrated wave front. Written that, I've expanded out now in polar coordinates, and I just point out some of the terms. You will notice that every term has a dependence on k, that's the scattering angle, and it also has an azimuthal dependence, which tells you about the shape. So here, for example, is defocus. It depends on the square of the scattering angle, but it has no azimuthal symmetry, so it's circularly symmetric. This one here, is what we call a two-fold astigmatism. So A1 is the coefficient of that two-fold astigmatism. Depend, tells you how strong the astigmatism is. It's a square dependence on the scattering angle, but it's now got this cosine term here, which shows you it's, it's 180 degrees symmetric. So it turns a point into a line. There's my friend, the three-fold astigmatism with his three-fold rotational symmetry. There's my spherical aberration, C3 here which now you notice has a fourth dependence on k. Now, what's the effect of these aberrations? Well, each one of these aberrations, or taken together as a sum, introduces a phase shift. You remember, in my model of my electron optical column, I said we have to model the objective lens. And what the objective lens does is it introduces phase shifts. So you can calculate the phase shift due to any one of these terms by simply multiplying it by 2 pi over lambda. If you do that, what you end up with is this zoo of aberrations. So here, for example, is defocus. Here is a two-fold astigmatism. Here is, that's a coma. There's an, a three-fold astigmatism, a CS, fifth order CS, etc. So all of these aberrations have an azimuthal symmetry and a radial order, that's the scattering angle dependence. And each one of these introduces a phase shift. So the sum of them all in my aberrated lens introduces a phase shift, an unwanted phase shift into the image. In my, in my phase contrast imaging, what I record is an intensity that comes from the interference of the beams coming out of the specimen. But now I've introduced this polluting phase shift. That's back to your question. This polluting phase shift, which scrambles all the phases and hence gives me data that no longer represents the structure of my material in projection. So there's just a few. I've just taken out the round aberrations here. You can see that's a spherical aberration. This is a fifth order. And that's a seventh order spherical aberration. You can see the between going from third to fifth to seventh order, the difference is the dependence on the scattering angle. So the seventh order, seventh order one has a, well, it's not even on this diagram, has a seventh 
a seventh power dependence on the scattering angle. This only has a third power dependence on the scattering angle. Yeah? Um, what's the reason why we usually don't call the defocus a first order, a zeroth order spherical aberration, but defocus is it just it, for it, historical it, It's a purely a historical. You could call it a first order spherical aberration, but I think defocus has become known in the folklore by now. Okay. So here is a modern, I showed this on Monday, here's a modern corrector from Neon Company. It's a, a, a significant piece of engineering, electrical and, me and mechanical engineering. This actually has a, it's a 19 layer corrector. It's got six quadrupole sextopole stages and three quadrupole octopole stages. And in fact, and it now minimizes or corrects for all the fifth order aberrations, all the C5s. It minimizes some of the seventh order aberrations, and itself it has a very low chromatic aberration coefficient. Now you can actually improve this by introducing some electrostatic, this is purely electromagnetic. If you put electrostatic elements into these correctors, you could also correct the chromatic aberration. I haven't got time today to show you the diagrams for those. They become hideously complicated very, very quickly, but you can now get microscopes electron microscopes which have both spherical aberration or axial aberration correctors and also chromatic aberration correctors. But the chromatic aberration correction requires an electrostatic field. Now the last part of the tools I want to talk about today is exit wave reconstruction. And this is very closely related to what John talked about yesterday. So this is an inversion problem. Remember what we record is an image intensity. So the image intensity records a real function. So we record an image and we've lost all our phase information. So in the forward process, we start off with a, a, an exit plane wave function, which is complex. We record a real image intensity and we've lost the phase data. And this is the phase problem. What the exit wave restoration aims to do is to invert this process, to go from an image intensity through some inversion back to the specimen exit plane wave. So what we are aiming at is a complex function with amplitude and a phase. Now, I, I emphasize again, we're only going back to this point here. What we're not attempting to do is to invert the scattering through the sample. This was talked about yesterday with Peter and John's talk. There is a second inversion problem because ultimately what we'd really like is not the wave function, what we'd really like is the projected potential. Because the projected potential tells us everything we need to know about our material. Now, in the limits of weak scattering, single scattering, then this exit wave will have a direct correspondence to the projected potential. But in general, when we have multiple scattering, significant multiple scattering, this exit plane wave function will not look necessarily like the projected potential, and that's the role of simulations. We still have to simulate the, from a model structure, simulate the forward scattering process to get an exit wave function. The, the benefit of this approach, however, is we're simulating just a complex wave function, whereas if we work from image data, we have to simulate the complex wave function and the effects of all the possible aberrations. So we're reducing the problem down from a, a many variable problem in, if we look at image data, to a single variable problem where we're just simulating a wave function. So we're only simulating the scattering. We don't have to worry about simulating the imaging process if we can do this uh, inversion. Now, the inversion is, is, is actually quite straightforward to do. I, I've chosen here the simplest possible case. Here's my object exit surface wave function. Here's my image plane wave, which is and what I record now is the image plane intensity. Now I'm going to make an assumption here. I'm going to make the assumption, which may or may not be true, is that we have only weak scattering. So I can ignore all the higher order terms. I'm then going to write this not as a, an intensity, but as a contrast. So that's just one minus the inten intensity minus one. And I'm going to take a Fourier transform. 
So the function I'm looking at is this C of k here, this is in reciprocal space, which is my image wave here, plus its complex conjugate. Now, the object wave, and that's the thing I want, and the image wave are related through this phase shifting transfer function, which models the objective lens. So that's this function here. So in other words, my image wave here is my object wave multiplied by W, and my contrast is just the wave multiplied by W and the complex conjugate plus some noise function here. I'm going to make another assumption, which again is not always going to be true. I'm going to make the assumption that we have what's called a weak phase object. Now a weak phase object is simply one where as the electron wave is scattered through the object, the phase shifts are small. If we make that assumption, then psi star is conjugate anti-symmetric with psi, and hence we end up finally with this equation here, that my contrast is just the wave multiplied by some function p plus a noise function. So the aim of the exit wave function reconstruction in this very simplistic framework is to solve for psi knowing measurements of c using a suitable restoring filter, which I'll call p, and that filter p is determined by the wave aberration function I mentioned earlier. Now, there is a, an issue here. If we use a single image, this um, function here will have zeros in it. So simply dividing the contrast by p in the presence of noise will amplify the noise to infinity where the function, where the, where the weight, where the phase shifting transfer function goes to zero. So a simple division won't work. We can go become a little bit more sophisticated. We could use something like a Wiener filter, for example, which suppresses noise in, where the signal is very weak, and that works perfectly well. But the key thing is, with a single image, there are going to be regions where this function goes to zero, So there's, and that's your question. There's no information at that point. And the way we get around that is we take sets of images. And the sets of images we take are either a set of focal series, so lots of images recorded at different defoci. And the way that works is, is quite simple. Here's the, here's the transfer function for a single image. You can see it's passed band, then it oscillates quite rapidly and it has zeros. However, if I choose many of these at different defoci, what happens is that these zero positions shift. So as long as I have enough of them, I will end up with a continuous transfer function from this focal series. So that's one option, is to take a series of images and use that to restore the, the wave function. Yeah? That assumes the scattering profile is the same across all measurements. So what that means is that you're only trying to correct for scattering issues that are caused by the instrument itself? Or yeah. I, I'm, itself? I, I'm not, I'm not, okay, it's a really good question. I'm not saying anything about the scattering. All I'm, I'm the scattering is determined by the object, the thickness, the composition, the orientation, etc. All I'm saying is that the wave function at the, what I want is the wave function at the exit surface. Now that's propagated through the microscope to give me an image, and I'm just changing the defocus of those images. So I'm, I'm not changing the scatterings, I'm not changing the object. I'm just changing the optics down the column. Yeah. Okay? The alternative way of doing this, which is something we worked on, is to actually tilt the illumination. If you tilt the illumination, you also shift the zeros. And the advantage of tilting the illumination is you can actually super resolve the data. You can actually get information beyond the conventional axial limit of the microscope. And this was done, we, we call this tilt series restoration. It's been now taken up by the optical community. They call it Fourier tychography, which I'll mention a bit later on. And in the optical world, it's actually a very nice experiment to do. All you do is you have a microscope where instead of having a single illumination source optically, you have an array of point sources. So an array of lasers, even an array of LEDs, and you light up or illuminate the object from different points in that extended illumination source, which effectively tilts the illumination. And that gives you a super resolution optical microscope very cheaply. In the electron case, we actually have to tilt the incident wave. 
But it can be done. This was Sarah Haig's work, uh, one of my former students, now professor at Manchester. This is back in 2009. This is her thesis work. And we showed that actually you can get something like a 41% improvement in the resolution compared to the axial limit. And this was a, a microscope which, record, which had a, an axial limit of something like 1.1, 1.2 angstroms. And we were able, this is silicon in the 112 projection, we were able to resolve the individual atomic columns of the silicon in 112 projection, and that's a 78 picometer spacing. So we're able to push the resolution from something like 1.1, 1.2 angstroms out to 0.78 angstroms using this tilt series restoration. And you can see that in the, in the power spectrum. This is just the power spectrum, the square modulus of the Fourier transform of that image I showed earlier. There's the axial limit at you know, 1.05 angstroms. That's the 333 reflection. And here is the super resolved power spectrum with data out to about 0 .72, 0 0.072 nanometers. So it's clearly super resolved compared to the axial limit. Now I want to move now into the second half of what I want to say this morning, and this is um, moving away from, if you like, the core tools, the optics and the wave function restoration, and actually show some examples of how these might be used in practice. And I think this is the area where maybe there's some discussions to be had over the next few months, because a lot of what we do now I think would benefit enormously from a, a, a rather more, I'm just a poor physicist, but a more sophisticated mathematical computational input. So I want to start by talking about tychography. Now John mentioned tychography yesterday for x-rays. I'm going to talk about it in the electron world. And the, the way that tychography works is in this cartoon here. This is the tychography that we, the, the particular form we use. But in general, what you do for tychography is you form an electron probe and you raster that probe across the specimen and you record in the far field a diffraction pattern. So for every probe position, you have a diffraction pattern in the far field. So this is a four-dimensional data set. It's got dimensions of x, y in the specimen plane and dimensions of r, theta in the diffraction plane. Now this is the geometry we use, that I'm going to talk about for the biology. We actually don't use a focused probe, we actually use a defocused probe, a little disk function, and we raster that disk across the specimen with an overlap each of the disk positions. Now the reason we're doing that rather than using a focused probe is, is twofold. Firstly, it minimizes the radiation damage, we can use a much lower electron flux, but also we can also use a much wider field of view. And for most biological systems, you need to have a fairly wide field of view because a lot of interesting biological structures are quite big. So, and we also, I should point out, we do all this at liquid nitrogen temperature with a sample contained in a, a vitreous ice film. So we plunge, freeze, rapidly freeze. Sri Ram talk, talks about this on Monday. Rapidly freeze a sample by plunging it into liquid ethane. It forms a vitreous ice thin film with the biological particles, proteins, viruses, whatever, stuck inside that vitreous ice film. So that's the geometry for Tychography, we raster a probe across the sample, and at every probe position we record a diffraction pattern. Now, why does tychography work? Well, first thing to point out is it, for any, and John mentioned this, any phase retrieval method that we want to introduce ha has to have, I think, four features. Firstly, it's got to provide the optimal wave transfer function. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, uh, sorry, can you go back to the other slide? Yeah, that one. Yeah. Yeah. So when you use defocus, do you have overlap on your yes. different? You have to overlap the probe positions. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, if you don't overlap the probe positions, you don't have the redundant information that tychography needs. Yeah. Okay. So a phase retrieval method. Firstly, it should provide the optimal wave transfer function. That that's fairly obvious. Secondly, it should use all the electrons that we have as efficiently as possible. Thirdly, it should be robust, if possible, to any residual aberrations. So it should be, it should be possible to computationally compensate any small residual aberrations that are left over. And finally, at least for a lot of materials, it should work very well at low electron flux. 
Now, the way the tychography works is what we record is the complex value of the amplitude in the microdiffraction plane. This is my diffraction pattern in the far field. And the detector records a four-dimensional intensity data set, because we're rastering the probe in 2D and recording diffraction patterns, which are two-dimensional. So we have a four-dimensional intensity data set, and all the phase information is lost. So all the stuff we actually want is not recorded in the data set. So in other words, what we now need to do is somehow get back the phase information from this intensity data set. Now, if you look at the intensity data set, that's the intensities there, we can expand that as a convolution of a probe function and my wave function. That's the thing I want. That's the thing I can try and measure, but we're recording it all as a square modulus. So all of this is convolved together. So we can't simply recover this thing here, the wave function I need, from that intensity data set. But John Roden, well, originally it was actually Hopper, but then John Rodenberg and Richard Bates showed very nicely that actually, if you take a Fourier transform with respect to R, you get a function I'm calling G here, and this function g, take the Fourier transform with respect to r, we now separate the probe function from the wave function. They're convolved, but they're now separated, and we no longer have the square modulus. Now, that's what this function g looks like. Um, this is, it's, people used to call it the trotter function, because it looks a bit like a pig's trotter end on. But it's actually called, the, officially, the overlap integral function. And this is what g looks like. So this is the phase and the amplitude of g. So there's my phase data, there's my amplitude data, and that's what I can use now to reconstruct my exit wave function. There are some challenges here. The first challenge is speed. If we want to match conventional STEM imaging, which uses a solid state detector, not a single pixel solid state detector, then the problem is we need to have detectors that work in the 10 kilohertz range. And most modern pixelated cameras work in the few kilohertz range. So tychography is inherently much slower than conventional STEM, although detectors are getting faster. And we also need this to work for very noisy probe and very noisy object data. Now, I should point out that there are many ways of using this function to get back my wave function. There are analytical solutions. There are also various iterative algorithms, some of which, as John pointed out, solve for just the wave function. Others solve for the probe and the wave function. There's a whole lecture on comparing these algorithms. They have very different convergence behaviors. Some converge very rapidly to a solution which is close to the optimum, but then wander around. Others converge extremely slowly, but always end up at the true solution. And in general, practically, what most people who do electron tychography use is some combination of algorithms. We use something like the so-called tychographic iterative engine, PI, which I think John mentioned yesterday, or EPI. That brings you very close to the solution. And then we switch algorithms and do the final refinement with a different algorithm. Okay? But these are all numerical iterative algorithms, so they always have the problem of convergence behavior. I should point out that convergence behavior is pretty nasty for, low, for noisy data. And one of the biggest problems for low-dose tychography is that we're solving for two functions, a probe, which is noisy, it's a noisy function, and an object, which is also a noisy function. And the algorithms, very often, as, as they get close to the true solution, they can't distinguish between the noisy probe and the noisy object. So what they do is they simply oscillate between the probe and the object and, and stagnate in their convergence behavior. And that's a significant problem for very low-dose tychography. Now, I want to talk, uh, the illustration I'm going to use today is tychography applied to biology. And there are some specific requirements for using tychography in biology or in cryo-EM. Firstly, it's a very low dose acquisition. We, we only have a very, very limited electron budget before we fry the sample. Secondly, we have to do the aberration measurement under these very low dose conditions. 
which means we're, we're measuring very noisy data to fit our aberration function, so it's a, an imprecise fit. The second point is you need to have tunable phase transfer because for, bio, for biological systems, you need not only the very high frequency information, the atomic scale information, you also need some low and medium frequency information which defines, for example, the envelope of a protein or a virus. You need to work over large fields of view because what you really want to do is you want to look at things like proteins or viruses in the cellular context. So you don't want to isolate your protein, multiply it, and then look at it in isolation. You actually want to look at the protein in the cell. That's the holy grail for biologists. And finally, we want to be able to use conventional three-dimensional reconstruction, these so-called single particle analysis pipelines. This is what um, Joachim Frank's contribution to the 2017 Nobel Prize was for, developing these single particle algorithms where you take two-dimensional data, you classify it as a function of orientation, and use that to reconstruct a three-dimensional object. So here's an example of some cryotychography in biology. I've got two examples here. This is a rotavirus. It's a so-called double-layered particle. It's a, it's a virus with little spiky bits. It's not unrelated to um, SARS-CoV-2. And here is the tychographic phase at 22 electrons per square angstrom. For all the material science in the room, this is a vanishingly small dose. Material science, we would use typically a few thousand or a few tens of thousands of electrons per square angstrom. And you can see you get a very nice um, projection of this double-layered particle. You get the same thing actually at 11 angstroms, and even down at 5 angstroms, you can still make up most of the structural features. The important feature on this uh, rotavirus is actually this so-called VP6 trimer. It's a little spiky thing that sits on the surface of the virus, and that's how it infects you. And that VP6 trimer has a spacing of 8.6 nanometers. You can see even in this data here, if I take a line profile just through this section here, you can clearly see that that trimer is still resolved, even at five electrons. This is a, uh, an immature HIV virus-like particle. And here, the key features are this so-called gag protein, and this double lipid envelope, and you can see clearly both of those, the, the, I've just blown this one up here and false colored it. You can see the double layered envelope and you can see this gag protein inside it. You can see the same sort of thing at 11 angstroms. In this case, down at five angstroms, you can just about make out the double layer envelope, but you can't really resolve much about the gag protein. So all that shows is that tychography at very low dose for biologists, it does work. Now, I mentioned earlier this, this desirability that we should be able to um, change or bandwidth tune the transfer in a tychographic experiment. And the way we can do that is simply by changing the convergence angle. So in tychography, if you change the convergence angle of my probe, change alpha here, what you do is you shift the transfer function. This is the experimental transfer function for a convergence angle of 1 millirad, 5 millirads, and 10 millirads. The d foci are different because they've been, the, these have been set. So as you change the convergence angle, we keep the spot size, the, the, the probe size on the sample the same. And you can see now you can tune the transfer function to low frequency, medium frequency, or very high frequency by simply changing the convergence angle. And notice the tychographic transfer function doesn't have any zeros. It's always zero at two alpha over lambda, but other than that, it's always positive. Compare that to my conventional CTF for a just a, a regular TM image. You can see here, if you change the defocus, you can extend the low frequency information, that's the red curve here, make the defocus much smaller, you get all the high frequency information, but the problem is this transfer function is oscillating like crazy. So you've got lots, not, hi Paul, 
Ingrid, so those uh, data on the top there, uh, experiments or yep. calculate? No. Is that why they're all the, those wiggles? It, it's experiments at 20 electrons per square angstrom. <laughs> so it's super. So by compa comparison to what we're used to, Paul, in materials, this is basically looking at something very, very faint through a dark window. Most of the structure there is noise. It's just noise. Yeah, right. it's just, it's just re it's reconstructed noise. So you can see here the problem with, C with conventional TEM is you, got all, you can change, you can enhance low frequencies, and that's in fact what most structural biology data does. But you pollute all the high frequencies with these zero functions. That's not a problem with tychography. So what we've tended to do recently is we take advantage of this, and we also take advantage of what we call biological homogeneity. And all that means is as Sriram said, is that if you have a virus particle, one virus particle is, to a very good first approximation, the same as every other virus particle of the same type. So biology is nice and homogeneous. So what we now do is record data at different convergence angles, and then we Fourier sum the data together to get a wide, a, a, an ultimate wide bandwidth reconstruction. So for example, we take low convergence semi-angle data, so this is emphasizing all the low frequency information. We take medium and we take high, and for the low frequency data we just run, and medium and high, we simply run that through a standard, a completely standard workflow that the structural biologists use for single particle analysis. The only difference is that rather than feeding image data in, we feed the tychographic phase in at different convergence angles, and that gives us three-dimensional structures at low frequency, high fre medium frequency, and high frequency. We Fourier synthesize those together, and what we get is, a band, is, is an ultra-wide bandwidth map. So you can see here, we've got all the low frequency information, but superimposed on that is all the high frequency information. And for those of you in the front, you may be able to see that these little trimers on the surface actually have the right threefold symmetry. So here's that data again, just displayed in a slightly different way. Here is the original phase data. You can see at one milliradian, it looks very blurred because we're emphasizing all the low frequency stuff. At medium and high frequencies, you get, the, you get more high frequency, and you get the, sorry, the smaller structural features appearing. But there is a problem. And that is, as you open up the convergence angle, you get higher and higher frequency information, but the contrast goes down. So the big challenge in, in this area now is to develop smart methods for correlating or aligning data with very low contrast. So here are 3D reconstructions. That's just a cross section through them. I, just, I, I show that because it just illustrates nicely. There's the low frequencies, the medium frequencies, the high frequencies. And here is actually just an enlargement of the density map for that VP6 trimer. See, at low, the, the low convergence angle data, it gives you the envelope at about 37 angstrom resolution. As you increase the convergence angle, you start to pick up the high frequency data. And at 5 millirads, you've got this 18.3 angstrom data, which clearly shows this uh, threefold symmetry. Just for comparison, here is the conventional TEM image of, or reconstruction of that trimer. You can see they're very, very similar. One thing that is important here is because the tychographic reconstructional phase is very, very efficient, it uses all the electrons efficiently, whereas the TEM doesn't because of all these zero crossings, we don't need as many particles for our single particle analysis. So if, if you read the structural biology literature, most of the structures published, they use thousands or tens of thousands of particles. We, in this case here, for this reconstruction here, we used a few hundred particles between 232 and 318. 232 was for this reconstruction, and the other ones had a few more particles. So we're using a few hundred particles, not a few thousand particles. And that's very useful, because it means you don't need as much material. So you don't have to extract and replicate your biological material. You can actually look at it at the sort of concentrations you find in cells. But to go further than this, there is this issue of how we um, actually align the data. Final slide on this I want to show is just, again, this is 
This is the experimental data again, low, medium, and high frequencies. You can see how that changes. There's the Fourier sum of them. And this is the tychographic, this is the transfer function. So you can see you get some information here from the low frequency, some from the medium, and some from the high frequencies in this beige thing here. The reason that these are different heights is that in the low frequency information, all of the electrons are contributing to a very small bandwidth. As you extend the convergence angle, they contribute over a larger bandwidth. So the heights of these are not quite the same. Now, I just want to throw something out there. Um, and this is a simulation. So this is a simulation of, um, this is apoferritin. So a standard biological test sample. It's a multi-slice simulation, and from the multi-slice simulation, we've calculated the tychographic phase. And we've calculated at a convergence angle of 15 milliradians, so a bit bigger than the one I showed earlier. But that's a convergence angle that's actually very, very easy to obtain in a modern aberration corrected instrument. We can actually end up with convergence angles of 140 milliradians. Now, at 15 milliradians, we actually get a resolution of about two angstroms. So we get actually we can actually start to see the individual protein chains making up this big complex. The problem we have is that experimentally, when we open up the convergence angle, we don't actually get that level of resolution at the moment. And the reason we don't get it is there's some sort of incoherent blurring, which we believe is due to charging. But we don't have a model for the charging. So I throw it out there. If anyone can come up with a suitable model for charging of essentially vitreous ice, then that might actually help us try and push this resolution out a lot further. So I throw that out there. Finally, I want to show you just a, a cell or a bit of a cell. This is actually an adenovirus infected cells. This is very wide field tychography, 27 electrons per square angstrom over a field that's a couple of microns by a couple of microns. And you can see here now that you can see some adenoviruses that infected this cell. There's a vacant vesicle here, some transport vesicles, and even some free ribosomes down here. So you can start to see all the components, all the cellular components recovered fully quantitatively with the tychographic phase. Now, I, I have to add here a health warning. And the health warning is, this is a very difficult experiment to do because the field of view is huge. And this experiment was actually carried out with 4,000 by 4,000 probe positions. So it requires extreme stability, or alternatively, it requires a model to deconvolve the probe drift and jitter in this experimental data set. Yeah? Uh, how long does it take to... Uh, I forget what the exposure was for each probe position. Probably for each probe was something like 100 microseconds, maybe a millisecond of that order. So again, models for deconvolving probe drift and jitter will make this experiment considerably easier and possibly can even extend out to wider fields of view. And that's really what the biologists want to see. They want to see cells in an infected state, not just the thing that infects the cells. Okay, <laughs> just talk a little bit about machine learning. And I'll talk, I want to talk about graph, I want to talk about two areas. Firstly, some defects in graphene that I mentioned on Monday, and also some catalyst dynamics. So we're interested in defects in graphene, and Chen Huang is one of my staff members developed some very nice machine learning codes for looking at um, defects in graphene. The first problem, and it's a problem generally with ML AI methods in electron microscopy, is there's a scarcity of experimental ground truth data. So you can't really rely on networks that have to be trained by experiment. So what Chen did was took a piece of pristine graphene and recognized that you can actually form all graphene defects from three very simple geometric operations, Either you can make a vacancy, you can add an extra atom in, or you can have a bond rotation, a so-called stone whales rotation. He did this. He generated millions of defects in large sheets of graphene from these geometric operations, just applying them at random, fed that into a neural network to predict 
and used that neural network to try and identify defects in experimental data, and it failed completely. And the reason it fell completely is doing it geometrically, you end up generating lots of unphysical defects. So you train the network to recognize things that don't exist in real life. To overcome that, what he then did was did the same thing, introduced the geometric defects, and then ran that graphene sheet through a molecular dynamics relaxation problem and used that to simulate images. So now what we have is a sheet that only contains physically sensible defects. Here I showed this on Monday, here's the output, there's the original input data, run through the network and the output from the network which is the atom positions, and this is just a cut, this is just a, a, a color-coded um, sort of mesh diagram of these defects. Now the ones I want to look at in a bit more detail quickly are these three here, the so-called, what I call the butterfly defect and the flower defect, and the butterfly defect can exist along two different zone axes, or two different mesh axes in the two-dimensional mesh. What we measure experimentally is the lifetime of these defects, and we know the electron flux, so we can calculate the average energy for these transitions. And you can transition from a die vacancy to a flower to a butterfly. There are, these are reversible processes between the die vacancy flower and the flower and butterfly, and there's also a route that goes straight from the die vacancy to the butterfly and backwards. And all of these are just mediated by a simple bond, a simple bond rotations that turn six member rings into groups of five and seven member rings. So what we did, we calculated, we measured the defect energy per defect. Here's the experimental data here for the die vacancy, the flower, the other flower, and a butterfly. And here are numbers here. And then Elena up at Nottingham calculated the defect energies. And you can see here the calculated ones and the experimental ones match very closely indeed. So what we're doing here is probing the, lo the local energy landscape of these defect transitions from EM data. So we're starting to get a handle on low scale, on very small scale kinetics. I should point out, this is a good data reduction problem. We started off with two million images, and what we ended up with was four numbers. So we got from two million images all the way through to four useful numbers. Right, very quickly, I want to talk a little bit about catalysis, and then I'll stop. Kevin has been working on networks for identifying catalyst nanoparticles, and this is a big industrial problem. This is the exhaust catalyst from a Mercedes car. This is a typical EM image that we all show in our papers. This thing weighs about one kilo. This thing has about seven nanoparticles in it. And what we want to do is handshake across these two enormously different length scales. Here is some typical image data. This is recorded now at half a millisecond per frame, 70 microseconds, and 20 microseconds. You can see the problem. At half a millisecond, you can clearly see the catalyst particle sitting on its support. At 70 microseconds, you can just about make out the lattice fringes. At 20, if you really squint hard, you can just about make out some of the structural detail. So the challenge to the networks is, can we interpret this very fast, noisy data, and can we use it in real systems? So not just model systems. What Kevin did was build a dual network it has a, a model generation part, which I, I haven't got time to talk about, but if anyone's interested, I can tell you how we generated the models. We simulated those models in, with a multi-slice calculation to give us a training data set. We fed that into the YOLO version 5 network for object detection, so that network just picks out nanoparticles. We took those individual detection boxes, there's, there's a single detection, and fed that through an encoder-decoder network to give segmented particles, and we use those to get useful structural data, things like particle size distributions, ellipsicities, all the things the catalyst community want to know about. Here's an example. Here's an ideal sample. You can see here flat background, fairly uniform nanoparticles. So this is our test case. Here is a real catalyst. You've got a very nasty, diverse carbon background, lots of different types of nanoparticles. This is a real case. So we ran those both through the network, or the dual network, and here's the outputs. So here's the ground truth. 
in gray. Here's the inference from the network, and you can see for the ideal case, it matches extremely well. Very low error rates. For the real catalyst, of course, the ground truth and the inference are not quite as close. You've got larger errors, but these errors are still acceptable if you're trying to measure useful industrial properties because we can do this for millions or tens of millions of images, and that gives us enough confidence to handshake that data with the typical sort of large, broad beam data that the catalyst community take. So it does go some way, even under these error bars, to providing useful data for the industrial case. I've only got a couple of slides. I want to show you just, this is a Colm O'Leary's thesis work, and this is what I talked about on Monday briefly. This is working in a binary counting mode. So this is actually the bright field disk that we use typographically. Each of those little spots a single electron hit. And we can use even this very, very low dose sparse data to give us a very good typographic phase reconstruction. And that's just an illustration of just how efficient typography is at recovering the phase data. Anyone fancies moving over to Oxford, I've currently got a vacancy for a permanent staff member position at the Rosalind Franklin Institute looking at a chromatically aberration corrected microscope, which will be delivered sometime early next year. Anyone's interested, I'm around all today, and, but I leave, I, fortunately I'll leave tomorrow morning. Okay, thank you very much.